Hey, Sam. Get on. What's the word? Anger. Anger? Yeah. Any new grudge endangers recovery. Where'd you hear that? I, I heard, heard it through, through the, the grapevine. grapevine. Welcome. It's the AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour, featuring the collected voices of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Don, an alcoholic in Greensboro, North Carolina. You sure are. Hey, everybody, I'm Sam, an alcoholic in Palm Springs, California. Well, that's a mighty small collection. Just two of us. <laughs> <laughs> there will be more. There will be more. Sam, what makes a person eligible to go to one of these super secret Alcoholics Anonymous meetings? Well, you have to have the secret decoder ring, and you get that <laughs> from a bottom of a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> There's one included in the bottles. That's a good idea. Is that promotion? Oh, that could be promotion. Yeah, yeah. Um, so seriously, I mean, one of the best things I ever heard was if you think you have a problem with drinking, then maybe go check out a meeting. Yeah. People who are not alcoholics don't tend to worry about their drinking. Not at all. <laughs> because they don't have a bit of a problem with it. Yeah. Take it or leave it, which is just not normal. You know, I didn't really know what an alcoholic was till I went to AA. Well, I also never had conversations with people about the problems that I was having with drinking. And, you know, when I went to those first AA meetings and, and listened to people sharing, I, you know, I heard people talking about stuff I related to. It was in a speaker meeting. Yeah, those are really good to go to when you're first coming around. Yeah, that's where somebody just stands and tells their story, what they were like when they were drinking, how they surrendered and what they're like today. This guy was talking about throwing his beer cans around in different locations so that they wouldn't <laughs> pile up in one place so that people wouldn't, his wife wouldn't see that he was an alcoholic. And <laughs> I didn't think I was an alcoholic, and, but I did that all the time. <laughs> I didn't hide my alcohol. But I had the evidence of it. <laughs> All those vodka bottles did not make it into the recycling bin. A lot of them went into the trash can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a pro at hiding. And I would also go around and buy beer at different locations so the people working behind the cash register wouldn't figure out that I was buying so much beer as if they <laughs> cared. <laughs> well, it's okay to go to any AA meeting and find out if you're an alcoholic, if you have the question. And I didn't realize how open it was. Open or closed? And that's the distinction that can be confusing. You know, if you're questioning about, do I have a problem with alcohol? You can go to any AA meeting. Whether or not it says it's open or closed, closed is for people who have a desire to quit drinking or who think they have a problem with alcohol. Open meetings are open to anybody, which means that, you know, there can be medical students that are going to that, or maybe family are coming to it to see a, a loved one pick up a chip or something like that too. Open meetings are not restricted to people who have a desire to stop drinking. Anybody that has a desire to stop drinking or has a problem with alcohol and just wants to find out, you don't even have to want to quit drinking. <laughs> you just, yeah, really just find out what alcoholism is. And that's what AA is there for, to help answer those questions. Today, we're talking to Chris B. about when and how he got sober. Chris has been sober since 1976. 1976. Good for him. I was having a great time in 1976. Drinking, drugging, generally ruining my life and building up a nice long amends list. I had many more years of drinking to do before I gave up. Well, you know, uh, I was six years sober in 1976. What? I didn't know you came in that early. Um, I wasn't in AA then. I mean, I was born in 1970. You weren't knee walking drunk. You were just plain knee walking. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully I was toddling about by then. <laughs> well, our guest, Chris, 
has been around long enough to develop some of that ninja old timer mojo. Should we give him an ask the old timer question from a listener? Yes. Melissa recorded a question. How do I know I'm a real alcoholic? If you want to submit your own question, call 212-870-3418. And then we'll have a blast from the past from a talk in Portland, Oregon in that miraculous year, 1976, when Chris got sober. It's by Father Martin. Don, you're old. Do you know Father Martin? Wait a minute. (laughs) Yes, I know who Father Martin is. I mean, I don't know him personally. But I saw his famous film, Chalk Talk. I've seen it on YouTube. It's clear. Alcoholism was not a bit different in 76 than it is today. We have about six minutes of him describing his drinking and awakening to the realization he was an alcoholic. But first, let's get to know Chris. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, I'm a member of the uh, Briarcliff Group in Westchester County. I'm also a member of the Ossining Scarborough Group, also in Westchester County. I got sober uh, May 17th of 1976. I've lived in Westchester my entire life. So when I came in, I was 25 years old. I got to tell you, it's been a revelation ever since I walked into the rooms of AA. Before walking in there, I had no idea of alcoholism. Back in 76, it wasn't as prominent in the um, social media or TV or things like that. So I I had heard the initials AA, but I really didn't know much about it other than I thought it had something to do with the Salvation Army down by the Bowery in Lower New York. Yeah. So how did you find out about it? Well, I, after my last drunk, which really was three drunks within a 24 hour period, I came to and it was felt like I had really like I had lost my mind. Uh, I guess it was some kind of alcoholic poisoning looking back on it, but I really felt really, really uh, at the jumping off point, put it that way. Mm. And so I was uh, reaching out for um, help because I really didn't know what was going on. It was really scary. I was not sleeping at all for like a couple of days. And I walked into this, it was almost dawn one Sunday morning and there was a church around the block. I walked into there. I hadn't been inside of a church in over like, you know, 12, 13 years. You walked into a church, you passed along the way, dropped yes, out. Right. <laughs> and you began about it. <laughs> signs, signs everywhere, the signs, right? <laughs> Later that day, though, I, I called over to, I could, like I say, I couldn't stay into that, stay in the church. I was too jumping. I called over to a place called New York Hospital. Back in the day, though, like 100 years ago, it used to be called the Bloomingdale Inebriate Asylum inebriate asylum interesting yeah, okay trying out place for like wealthy uh westchester people i called over and the lady answered the phone and she said uh i felt i said i wanted to make an appointment with a psychiatrist and she said well uh do you feel like you're going to hurt yourself and i said well no but i really didn't feel like living she said do you use drugs i said no she said do you drink i said well yeah you know i drink she said well how much do you drink i said well i don't know a normal amount she said, well, how many, how many nights a week would you say that you drink? Uh, four, five? <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> it on. She was a pro. And she said, look, um, while we do this, I'll give you the address of, uh, of an AA meeting. Go to these meetings for a week. At the end of the week, if you still want to make an appointment, call us back. We'll send something up. And so I said, uh, okay. Wrote down the number and hung up. And I thought to myself, what the hell is this lady talking about? AA. I mean, I'm 25 years old. I mean, I drank a lot, but I, you know, I have a lot of bad habits. And I, I really was like scratching my head. Like, so the next day I went to this meeting she suggested, which was called Sponsor House, which is in White Plains, New York. It was a daytime meeting. And I walk in, I was early because the uh, lady who runs it was in the little office in the back. It was kind of like a clubhouse deal. She was in with one of her sponsees, although back then they used to call them pigeons. Pigeons, yeah. An old timer when I got sober that always talked about his pigeons. I was called a pigeon when I first got sober. I hated it. <laughs> yeah, well, it is, that's why it is kind of a demeaning, but um, yeah. but that's what, the, what they used to call it. But anyway. So I'm, I walk in and, and I'm like looking around. I was an empty. I was a little early, there a little early. And I'm looking at the slogans and I'm thinking, what the hell? All this fancy lettering. I thought it was something to do with Regis Digest or the Salvation Army or <laughs> much for the grace of God. And, you know, God. But the thing is, I, I, I sat down. And I was kind of like a fly on the wall. People started filtering in. 
And I notice all these, you know, well-dressed people, you know, like businessmen, housewives, coming in, chatting with each other, looking, you know, normal as all get out. And then they sat down, they started the meeting and they stood to a person. They're saying, you know, my name is Bob. I'm an alcoholic. And my name is, they would say my name is so-and-so, I'm an alcoholic. And I'm thinking, I'm sitting up like, wow, these people are like really on middle of the day and admitting something like I'm an alcoholic, which was kind of like, you know, back then was like, you know, that's the worst thing you'd say about somebody. Shameful. Yeah. 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 Something to be concealed. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But then one lady, she looked like she was like a librarian, little sweet old lady, talked about how she had gotten pulled over by, for drinking. And she got out and took a swing at the cop. What the? <laughs> so now I'm like sitting up on my seat, like paying attention to what these people are talking about. She's making then, it attractive. <laughs> well, yeah. And I'm like, what the? And then I'm thinking, shoot, you know, I, I wrecked a car. I ran. <laughs> I had a little Volkswagen bug. I ran into the telephone pole and the, broke the telephone pole in half. I was going that fast. My car flipped over. I landed upside down. I crawled out through the windshield. The car, the car was just a crumpled piece of metal, a little ball like a turtle on its back. The next night, I was back at the Candlelight Inn, which is where I used to drink, where they had a little batch book that said, where smart people meet. I was back in the bar, and I said to the guy next to me, you know, I'm staying away from that Heineken. I'm going to stick with Budweiser. <laughs> Because that's your plan. I mean, and, and at the time, it made perfect sense to me. It's like that's how smart people think. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think if I hadn't been drinking Heineken, I wouldn't have wrecked my car. So uh, my my solution was to drink Budweiser. Did it work? No. <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know, years later, we learned that the alcohol doesn't really care what form it's in, right? No, no, it does. <laughs> <laughs> at that meeting, I, I really was. Uh, there was a number of people I identified with, and by the time it came around, my turn to talk. Instead of being some cynical, wise-ass 25-year-old kid, I said, my name is Chris and I'm an alcoholic. And I knew it was true. I really did. I could, I could look back at numerous examples in my drinking history. And by the time it came, it was as plain as the nose on my face that it was the alcohol all along. And prior to my walking into that meeting, I just couldn't see it. I could ah. not see it at all. I mean... I remember being at the bar, like say on a Tuesday afternoon and drinking my doors on the rocks with a little water and trying to really like give myself a good talking to like, why is my life such a mess? Why am I so screwed up? What the heck is wrong with me? What is, you know, what is going on? I'm really trying to figure things out, giving myself a very serious talking to. Meanwhile, ordering doors on the rocks. So the, the problem was in my hand and I could not see it. I mean, it's just, it was as simple as that. I thought for some reason that it was my friend because I felt good when I first started. The first 45 minutes of my drinking it was like, uh, I could take a breath. I could relax. Life yes. wasn't so bad. And so to me, alcohol, I associated with that. But I didn't associate it with what, like I wound up in jail once for drunk driving. I wound up wrecking my car. I wound up in a number, number of accidents. I had a scholarship to college. And I dropped out of that. I couldn't see the, the, the bad effects, only that immediate gratification of feeling good. But I didn't feel good when I was not drinking. And the first five, 45 minutes, I did feel good. You're 25 years old. Yeah. Going to an AA meeting in 76. So... Were there other people your age there? Yeah, there were. Not that first meeting, but as I started, they suggested I go to you know meetings you know, every day. The real question was, somebody young coming into AA, how did you identify with these older people? Well, it, it, I was lucky that I was able to. I guess I, I hit bottom hard enough that I was uh, really, uh, I took to heart the uh, message I was getting. People talking about things didn't happen to you yet. Uh, I started reading the literature and said some people really have problems way before they really had to go through the terrible things that a lot of people did that, you know, so many people wish they had come in at my age. I used to hear that a lot from the, from the old timers. Mm -hmm. But the other token is there were people even younger than, than myself at the time. Mm -hmm. So we've heard a lot about the early part. What's uh, what's recovery look like for you today? Well, wow. to me, it's just amazing. I turned 71 a couple of weeks ago, and I've been retired for five years. But when I came in to the, to the program, I had hit, I had always done well in school if I had tried. 
I had very, you know, <laughs> did very well, good on aptitude tests, things like that. I relate By to the that. Time I, I came to my first moon, I was driving a good humor truck. I don't know if they have it in California, but it's a, just a little ice cream truck. That was my job. But I got sober and then I wound up going back to college at night because I had dropped out when I was drinking because I wanted to drink full time, basically. And so I started going back to college at night. I really enjoyed it now because I was sober. I was paying attention. I was doing it voluntarily. And then I wound up going to law school. I became a lawyer. And so I was a lawyer from 86 until I re retired five years ago. Would you say sobriety brought you that? I mean, you went from driving oh. a good humor truck to going to school. No doubt. The only difference was I put down the drink and came to AA meetings. On my own, I could not stop. I would, I would constantly try to limit it, to go for periods without drinking. But each time, I would wind up in the exact same soup. It was un unerring that it would happen. And yeah. yet I kept trying to do it. So for, for, for me, I drank, I really started drinking when I was about 18 until I was 25. So I had a seven year run. Uh, but I, you know, right from the start, I just drank. I, see, the thing is, I grew up in a house, I was one of the 13 children. It was a dysfunctional household and we didn't have any discipline at all. So I was used to just doing whatever I wanted to. So even though I had this, this uh, scholarship to college, I dropped out so I could drink and I just devoted my life to drinking. Well, right. There's, I mean, right. There's the story. I dropped out to drink. I mean, I got, I got to get my priorities straight. Well, yeah. <laughs> and, and an alcoholic who has nothing to answer to. Oh my. I mean, that's a, that's a dream, right? I know. <laughs> it's an amazing thing that I've seen time and time again in AA is that people come in, then they decide, well, I want to go to school and I've had numerous sponsees that I've helped go through school. There was at some point, I can't do this. I'm going to flunk out. I'm going to quit. No, it's the one day at a time. Uh -huh. The one day at a time thing. I can, you can get through anything one day at a time. Right, right. And right. I've seen people graduate and then go on and have full careers. And yeah. it's all from being yeah. sober because before yeah. The priority was to drink rather than to do sure. anything sure. else. Yeah, yeah. The other thing, too, is uh, that, you know, you hear about the yets. This thing didn't happen to you yet, blah, blah, blah. Well, the thing is, I, the way I see it, the good things are also yets. You know, I'm not a lawyer yet, or I've never been able to do X, Y, and Z yet. You can still, you know, the thing is, if you're alive and you're sober is, and you have the, you know, initiative to do things, you can, there's a lot you can do. And, That's uh, a fantastic twist on that. I like that. <laughs> Good yet. But it's true. It's true. Really yeah. yeah. So I'm curious, in, in these 45 years of sobriety, has there been a point where something came up that was kind of like Don was talking about, about his sponsees who were like, I can't do this. It's too hard. I'm going to flunk out. Have you experienced something that was like, this is too much? Yes. Uh, I As I said, I worked in a... Um, in New York City, real estate and uh, in New York City, title insurance, it's really, uh, as you can imagine, it's a real pressure situation. You're dealing, I was dealing with these law firms, really, you know, top, and the people are not to say anything bad about lawyers, but some of them are really like sharks, you know, they're really, and the paralegals are sometimes even worse. And so you're under this constant pressure of uh, timing. Where's this? Where's this? You got to do this. You got to do that. I was working so many hours, I found it hard to get to meetings. I would go to like a day meeting. I'd come in late and leave early so that I could get back to the office, that kind of thing. So for a period of time, it was really grinding on me. And I really felt, uh, you know, depressed and uh, not not good at all. But I really kind of focused to redouble my efforts on uh, on the AA meetings. I found this meeting that met on 830 on Friday nights, which was good for me because I commuted to the city. And so for me to get back by, sometimes it was just impossible. I couldn't get to a 7.30 meeting. And one thing I got to say, when we first came in back in 76, all the meetings were at nine o'clock at night. Oh, wow. Nine to 10. And then there would be everybody just shooting the breeze afterwards to like 10, 15. Whoever was responsible would be flashing lights, like light, like last call at a bar. <laughs> yeah. And then everybody would go to the diner. And so you know, sometimes you, you would get home, it might be like midnight, but it was just all shooting the breeze with AAP people you know so yeah. it was really kind of fun yeah uh so anyway yeah i went through this uh period it was really uh it was just so much pressure i that made me feel like uh kind of like death warmed up and you ended up deciding that the, in a high pressure situation where you don't have time the best thing for you to do was to build in a meeting into your schedule yes yes and then try to uh practice the principles in all your affairs you know as somebody would be really a 
obnoxious about something and I would put them on hold and I would say, well, is there anything I can do about that person? No, there's not. So then I take them off hold on the phone and I would just kind of like calm down a bit. So the, the precepts that you learn in AA and the tricks and the, uh, are just really valuable in real life too. I mean, it, I know lots of people who just simply the, once they've gotten sober, just don't have time to go to meetings. And uh, I also am retired now. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And I have to be on guard against saying, you know, you need to just get to a meeting. And it's like, you just got some, well, you're yeah. retired. I was like, okay, that's true. <laughs> but even though the pressures of life are on me, even when I was working full time and it, it was like 12 hours a day, I do not have time to go to a meeting. I found that if I would go to a meeting, the pressures that I felt I could release. Mm -hmm. And so even though I don't have time to go to a meeting, the best thing for me to do was to go to a meeting. And then the rest of my time was more productive. Yeah. A lot of truth there. How would you talk to someone who's got too much going on in their life in sobriety to get to meetings? Well, I mean, now it's really easy. What with the zoom, I mean, I kind of prefer the zoom. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I had a Zoom account back in you know, March of 2020, so I took over the leading the Zoom meetings for this the Austin Scarborough group, and I was one of the three people at the Briarcliff group. So I wound up going to uh, at least five meetings a week on Zoom, but it was easy because I'm just sitting in front of my you know computer. and uh, mm -hmm. It takes less time. You don't have the time before the meeting and the time after. You just show up and you're at the meeting. You don't <laughs> even have to put on pants. <laughs> Nah, well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the meetings, you can go to any meeting around the world. So they're they're certainly going on 24-7, right? Yeah. Well, there's one I was asked to speak at a meeting. It was 6 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, it was an online meeting where they go 24-7. Somebody told me early on that you can always tell the people in AA who are doing service. They're the ones who are smiling. And so when you're doing it, when I'm, I find when I'm doing work, talking to newcomers or just, you know, contributing, it's in a way selfish because I feel better when I do it. Yeah, service is super important in recovery. It surely is. Hey, yeah. Chris, we, we've got you here under the guise of, you know, having a chat with you, but, you know, we also wanted to throw a curveball at you and get All you right. one of those ask the old timer questions because you definitely qualify with 45 years of recovery. <laughs> oh, so you. we're going to play this question for you. Hi, my name's Melissa H. I'm from Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. My question for the old timer is, how did you know you were a real alcoholic? Well, Melissa, what I found about knowing I was a real alcoholic was um, just getting the information from the people at the meetings I was attending and keeping an open mind. Uh, I wasn't uh, wholly convinced right at the start, I guess, because I really kind of wanted to drink, but I was paying attention to see what these people were saying and see if it applied to my own situation. Luckily for me, what really convinced me was when I took to heart what they were saying and put down the drink. Within three or four days, I was jonesing for a drink. I was sweating. I wasn't sleeping. I had this really physical reaction to not having a drink in my body. And so that, in a way, really convinced me that this is life and death. I was heard it was a progressive fatal disease. And the way I felt when I put down the drink, immediately was I, I did feel like I was going to die. And so for me, how I knew I was an alcoholic was a combination of getting the uh, information from the people who are sober in AA and my own physical reaction to the absence of alcohol. Yeah, I just had to face up to the facts that this is it. I mean, some people have this illness, some people don't, but I happen to have it and uh, I don't I don't feel ashamed about it. It is a disease and some people have it, you know, whatever percentage of the population. But the key thing is I had to acknowledge or accept or whatever the fact that it applied to me. And then the other thing, too, that really convinced me is I just noticed how much better my life got, and sometimes slowly, but surely when I did put down the drink. And so for me, it's really, um, in a way, a no brainer. I mean, I looked at the way I was when I drank and the way I feel now. I'm just convinced that uh, it was the alcohol all along. What well, you know, I've had the experience like two years into sobriety and reading the big book, it would come up on the line, but the real alcoholic. And I've heard people say, I'm so-and-so, I'm a real alcoholic. And every time that came up, 
in my mind, I would go real alcoholic. I wonder if I'm a real alcoholic. Now I'm an alcoholic. There's no yeah. question about it. I mean, you can always go out to your nearest bar room and try some controlled drinking. <laughs> I mean, room. excuse me, bar room. Yes. And it won't work. <laughs> and I know it won't work, but that would jump on me. Am I a real alcoholic? So what do you do with that voice? Well, um, luckily for me, I don't, that doesn't really come up. I got to tell you, sometimes though, it'll be like a really, uh, like a nice Friday evening. And it's like really, it's about seven o'clock at night and it's nice and balmy or whatever. And, and the, uh, cause I, I was a barroom drinker uh, or a barroom drinker. <laughs> and uh, I would, uh, I would love to go to the bar. I would just love to go out. And so sometimes that, that, that feeling just comes up. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, sometimes you hear a song and you're so all of a sudden you're thrown back to eighth mm -hmm. grade when you had a crush on some girl or something. The thing is, they talk about the unguarded moment. I mean, we're all in this real world where there's alcohol is basically foisted on you a lot of times. I got to, in the mornings, I ask for help to stay sober that day. And the evenings I say, thanks. But I got to tell you one story that I was, I, I got into winter hiking. So we went in the Adirondacks and there was one of the big mountains and we were up there and it was ice and snow and we had crampons and ice axes and, and we climb up. There's a group of about, not people in AA, but just people I was hiking with. And we get to the top and it's really kind of a difficult climb. And there was a group of people from Montreal there. Two of the guys in that group had completed their final of the 35 peaks. They had like a list of the 35 highest peaks. So they're having this big celebration. So I walk up and this really attractive lady comes up to me with a glass of champagne. Would you like some champagne with this French accent? Who would have figured that the top of the thing have some beautiful woman <laughs> they offer you a yes. glass of champagne? Yes. But stuff like that happens. It's just the unguarded moment. Uh, but anyway, this lady, Mary Ann, who used to run the spot at my first meeting, she used to have a saying, I know you can't say it, you'll have to blurt it, but she, when the thought it came to her that it would be really nice to have a drink, she had a mantra that just was booze as shit, and then she would go on to the next thought, and uh, that kind of just helped her <laughs> that segue, simple. Yeah. segue in, back into life there, you know. So, That's yeah. fantastic. I mean, I was convinced when I came in that there's just no way that drinking is going to work for me again. Hmm. I knew without a doubt that to take a drink, it's going to take over again. Yeah, yeah. Now, I wasn't convinced when I came in. I got convinced. Right. Mm -hmm. I was still trying to make this work and I'm mm -hmm. going to figure this out. You know, I mean, my first meeting was when I was 18. The second one was 32. Mm -hmm. At 32, it took about mm, eight months of mm -hmm. in and out and trying to do this my way. Yeah. Before I finally accepted that I just cannot do this. Some people call that and they went out for a convincer. Yeah. Yes. A flip they wanted to. Yeah. It's that failure that taught me that it's not going to work again. Yeah. Indeed. The other thing too for me is um, when I first came in, I felt so bad. I, I felt just really terrible. I really wanted to be dead. And I couldn't think of anything positive about that. Like, why was I born to feel like this, go through this, this misery, this torture? I couldn't wrap my mind around what the hell the sense of it was. But looking back on it now, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Because if I hadn't suffered like that, that intense suffering, would I have been open-minded enough to uh, follow the uh, program of AA? Would I have been honest enough? I, if I didn't feel that bad, I could have said, well, these people are nuts. Let me go back to the bar and have a few more. And I might have you know, just continued on my you know, not so merry way. Getting to that real painful, unfortunately for the for most people in AA, you really got to go through the ringer to throw in the towel. It's, uh, I guess, part of the deal. It certainly it's is right. my experience too there, Chris. Mm -hmm. Hey, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you being a part of the podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Melissa, thanks so much for sending in your question for the old timer. If you'd like to submit your own Ask the Old Timer question, you can learn more about how to do that at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Blast from the past. I believe that an alcoholic is someone whose drinking makes trouble because what makes trouble is trouble. I use one single solitary question to diagnose the disease. Do normal drinkers do this? If your answer is no, you're talking about abnormalcy. It, it is that simple. 
Look at the major problems of your life. Has the bottle been in the picture before, during, or after? If your answer is yes, sign up. <laughs> so there are a couple of little teensy weensy key questions to ask to find out whether or not you belong here. Number one, did you ever lie about your drinking? You see, normal drinkers have no reason to lie. I didn't lie much about my drinking. I wasn't asked very much about my drinking. <laughs> However, I remember one beautiful case. A superior called me in. He said, have you been drinking? I said, no, Father. Now, I knew I was lying, and he knew I was lying. I knew he knew I was lying. <laughs> and I lied. My friends, do you know why we alcoholics went through that degrading business of lying to people who knew the truth? If I tell you the truth about my drinking, you're going to tell me to quit, and I know I can't. I know that alcohol is essential to living, and I will do anything to protect it. That's why we lied. Have you ever had your drinking discussed by others? Just answer this. It's real easy. Have you and your wife or husband and three or four other couples ever sat around on a Saturday afternoon and seriously talked about somebody else's intake of sliced tomatoes? <laughs> you see what I'm doing, don't you? I'm strangling the daylights out of the obvious. People don't talk about our drinking unless there is a drinking problem. It's the classic textbook case where there's smoke, there's fire. And you know what? Earth shattering problem absolutely paralyzed us gigantic intellects when we were drinking? This is somebody said, we alcoholics are a cut above average intellectually. <laughs> I always say, there's damn many of us is bound to be a brain somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but probably the most horrendous obstacle that we faced in life when we were drinking how to get rid of empty bottles. <laughs> means absolutely nothing to a normal person. A little kid will look at you and say, throw them out. <laughs> oh, oh, it's too simple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I was first ordained, they sent me to Mountain View, California. I had a lovely walk-in closet in the quarters out there. They were beautiful quarters in which I had two suitcases, and I saved them to save empties. <laughs> and between them, they held somewhere between 40 and 50 empty fifth bottles. And when the two suitcases became full, I emptied them. Now, we were out in the, the uh, orchard country down there in Santa Clara Valley. We had our own uh, dump behind the, one of the old barns back there. So I was smart. I waited until the kids were in class. And I take my two suitcases and I head out the side of the building down past all the athletic facilities and the ball fields out behind the barn. Never occurred to me that all I had to do was look out the window. <laughs> <laughs> what they would have seen was Mrs. Martin's little boy dressed in a long flowing black cassock carrying two suitcases heading into the hills. <laughs> it never occurred to me they might have thought that would be slightly weird. <laughs> but anyway, I would reach the haven of refuge down there, the lovely dump, and I would bury these dead soldiers one at a time, <laughs> consoled by the fact that every one of those dead soldiers had a priest with him when he died. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is about the only funny thing that I know to tell you about my drinking. Uh, very shortly thereafter, I only drank for ten years and five were rather trouble-free. The rest were rather slowly progressive. How many of you made AA for good behavior? <laughs> How many of you gals got into the program for being wife of the year? <laughs> I 
I went back to Baltimore and spent the two most horrible, frustrated years of my life. Ladies and gentlemen, this has happened to every alcoholic in this room. I tried to quit drinking and could not. And the quiet terror begins to take over your soul. You know something's wrong. You vaguely know that it has to do with alcohol, but you don't want to believe that. Because alcohol is your dearest friend, because the only thing that alleviates the terror is more of the drug that's creating it. The vicious, vicious circle of compulsive drinking. <laughs> the nameless fear. A wino stumbles up to a stranded biker on the side of the highway. Hey, buddy, you got any spare change? No, just leave me alone. Uh, what happened to your motorcycle? Piston broke. Yeah, piston broke. Me too. <laughs> 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 it's really not that funny. Thanks for joining us. The AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour is posted every Monday and is produced by AA Grapevine Inc. We don't speak for AA as a whole. We share the experience, strength, and hope of members to help others recover from alcoholism. Podcast info, including how to call in, is at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Find A.A. Grapevine on Instagram and the A.A. Grapevine channel on YouTube. All things Grapevine are available at aagrapevine.org. If you want to know more about A.A., Google Alcoholics Anonymous and your city or visit a.a.org.